ओम नमो भगवते रमणाय दिस इज मुरली फ्रॉम मिशिगन सत्संग हैप्पी एडवेंट डे टुडे वी हैव अ रीडिंग फ्रॉम श्री भार्गव मेहता ऑन अरुणाचल पंचरत्नम एंड बाय माय सेल्फ ऑन भगवान कुकिंग फ्रॉम रमण स्मृति ओम नमो भगवते श्री रमणाय I am Bhargav Mehta from Michigan, USA. I am presenting a synopsis on Sri Aruna Chala Pancharatnam. That is a word for word translation and the explanatory paraphrases. The original verses in Sanskrit and Tamil graciously were composed by Bhagwan Sri Ramana. and word for word english translation and commentary by sri sadhu om and mr michael james verse number 1 karuna purna sudabde kabalit gan vishwarup kirana valya aruna chal parmatman अरुणो भवचितकंज सुविकाय ओ ओशन ऑफ एम्ब्रोजिया द ओवरफ्लोइंग फुलनेस ऑफ ग्रेस ओ अरुणाचला सुप्रीम स्पिरिट बाय हूज सीरीज ऑफ रेज द सॉलिड फॉर्म ऑफ द यूनिवर्स इज स्वेलोड बी द सन फॉर द कंप्लीट ब्लॉसमिंग ऑफ माय माइंड लोटस The explanatory paraphrase, O ocean of Amrita, the ambrosia of immortality, which is the fullness of grace, O Arunagiri, the supreme self, the Paramatma who swallow everything, that is the entire world appearance, by spreading rays of the light of self knowledge, graciously shine as the sun of. self knowledge that will cause my mind lotus which is swelling with love and ready to blossom fully verse number 2 tvai aruna chala sarvam bhutva sthitva pralina metat chitram rudya hamityatmataya नृत्य सिबोस्ते वदंती हृदय नाम ओ अरुणाचला इन यू ऑल दिस पिक्चर कम्स इन टू एग्जिस्टेंस इज सस्टेन्ड एंड इज डिस्ट्रॉइड यू डेंस इन द हार्ट एज सेल्फ और द स्पिरिट एज आई एंड हैंस दे से हार्ट इज नेम टू यू द एक्सप्लेनेटरी पैराफ्रेस O Arunachala the red hill all this world appearance which is a picture rises stands and subsides only in you since you dance eternally in the heart as the consciousness i the real self those who know the truth that is the gnanis say that your name itself is heart or the radayam वर्ष नंबर थ्री अहमिति कुत आयाती अन्वेष्यंत प्रविष्ट आत्मल दिया अवगम्य स्वरूप श्याम्यतरुणाचल तय नदी वाप्त ओ अरुणाचल बाय अ वेरी ब्लैमिशलेस माइंड हैविंग सॉट दस from where does it come as i having entered within and having known one's own form one becomes still in you like a river in the ocean the explanatory paraphrase o arunachala having scrutinized with that pure mind which is facing self first that is ahamukham where does this i arise and having thereby clearly known the form that is the real nature of i one ceases to exist 
by merging in you like a river which merges and loses its form in the ocean no thus verse number 4 tyaktva vishayam bahyam ruddh prane na ruddh manasantastvam dhyayan pasyati yogi diditi marunachal tvai mahiyam te o arunachala having given up external objects and having meditated upon you within by a mind restrained by the restrained breath the yogi sees the light they are exalted in you the explanatory paraphrase o self shining arunesha having given up attending to external that is the second and third person objects and having meditated upon you the real self who shine as i in the heart with a mind which has become still by restraining the breath the yogi sees the light of self knowledge and attains greatness in you by thus uniting with you the embodiment of all greatness no this verse number 5 वै अर्पित मन सात्वाम पश्यन सर्वम तवा कृतितया सततम बजते नन्य प्रीत्या सजयत्य अरुणाचल त्वै सुखे मग्नः ओ अरुणाचल सीइंग यू बाय माइंड सरेंडर्ड इन यू he who by otherless love always worships everything as your form triumphs having drowned in bliss in you explanatory paraphrase o arunachala he who seeing you always by mind which has been surrendered to you without a sense of otherness loves everything as your form victoriously attains the goal of human birth having merged his individuality in you the real self who are the form of bliss the concluding verse shri madramana maharshi darshan maruna chalasya devagira panchak marya gitau rat nam tvidamau panishadam hi these five verses in praise of arunachala which are a revelation that is the darshanam of shrimad ramana maharshi by means of sanskrit in arya gita they are indeed upanishadic gems the sanskrit version of this concluding verse was composed by a devotee named daivarata and the tamil version was composed by shri bhagwan om namo bhagavate shri ramanaay ramana smriti part 2 chapter 6 bhagwan's cooking sundaram sundalam later known as sadhu trivenigiri swami was very popular in the ashram because of his genial nature at the shrine of shri subramanya at tiruchandur he heard the lord say here i am a god who does not talk go to tiruvannamalai there i am talking and walking thus he came to shri bhagavan listened to his teachings about the heart stayed in the ashram and meditated in his presence with the death of my wife the bond between me and my family snapped the desire to serve god had been in my mind for quite a long time i gathered courage and gave up my job at that time i had heard a lot about bhagavan and so decided to go to ramanashramam i found bhagavan in a hall with only two or three people sitting near him soon the dinner bell was heard and bhagavan got up and invited me for food at that time i did not take food at night and so i told him swami niraj niranjana danda bhagavan's younger brother was the ashram manager everybody called him chinna swami 
He managed the ashram with great devotion and energy. Literally, he found an ashram of grass and made it one of solid stone. The amount of work he put into it was unbelievable. He knew my family very well. On hearing that I wanted to give myself to a life of service, the very next day he gave me some documents and sent me to Madras on ashram business. Thus, I was fortunate to be taken on the ashram staff immediately after my arrival. After my return from Madras, I was employed in the bookshop and later I was looking after the ashram's correspondence. Still later, I was asked to work in the kitchen. There, I had the good fortune to work under Bhagavan's direct supervision. I had been suffering from asthma for many years. It gave me much trouble while cooking, but I did not even mention it to Bhagavan. I felt that my job was to endure to the very end and let things take their own course. Bhagavan used to prepare various kinds of chutney, usually made of coconut with fragrant herbs and condiments. He was very fond of using the cheapest and the most commonly found herbs and seeds and was a wizard in making wonderful dishes from the simplest ingredients. When something unusual was ready, he would give everybody in the kitchen a pinch of taste and we would take it with eyes closed, deeming it to be prasad. On one such occasion, he gave me a pinch of chutney and said, This is medicine for you. Without giving much thought to it, I swallowed the tidbit and soon realized that I was completely cured of asthma. Once somebody complained to Bhagavan that the ashram food was very pungent, full of ch- chilies and spices to the point of leaving a burning feeling in the stomach. He said, when sattvic mild food is essential, is essential for spiritual practice, how is it that the ashram food so, is so heavily spiced? Bhagavan explained that as long as the ingredients are pure and prepared in a pure place and in the proper way, seasoning is a matter of taste and habit and does not make the food any less sattvic. In the north, he said, people take plenty of milk and butter and hardly any spices, yet they quarrel and fight like anything. In Tanjore, they spice their food up so that it tastes like fire, and yet they are cool-headed and mild people. We must prepare food that would please everybody. Those who find it too hot can dilute it with rice or buttermilk. The ashram resources would not permit an increase of the permanent staff beyond a certain number, so there was plenty of work to do. An unwritten rule in the ashram demanded that until the last meal was served and cleared, the workers should attend to the duties only. Sitting in meditation or in Bhagavan's hall was strongly discouraged. The manager argued, with good reason, that Devoted service to the ashram was itself spiritual practice of the highest order and no other practice was needed. He would not allow us to linger in the hall during working hours, which was often tantalizing because of the interesting discussions and happenings that were going on there. When we would sneak in and hide ourselves behind Bhagavan, behind people's back, Bhagavan would look at us significantly, as if saying, better go do your work, don't ask for trouble. At night, after dinner was over, we would all collect around Bhagavan. The visitors would have left by that time and we had him all to ourselves. We felt like a big family collected after a day's work. During this short hour, Bhagavan would inquire about our welfare, chat with us, make us laugh and also give instructions for the next day. It was strange how little I understood Bhagavan in the beginning. I thought him to be a good man, that was all. Slowly I came to understand that I was dealing with God himself, my supreme master in whose hands lay my life and my salvation. With time 
I realized that working with Bhagavan in the kitchen was not mere cooking, but definitely a form of spiritual training. The first lesson in spiritual education to learn and to learn for good is to obey the Guru implicitly without questioning or using one's judgment in the least. Even if we knew a better way of doing it, we had to do it exactly as the Master told us. It might have appeared that by obeying Him the, the work would be ruined, but still one had to obey. One must master this act of instantaneous and unquestioning obedience, for the secret of realization lies in this utter surrender and renunciation of one's own judgment. A good object lesson in obedience was Bhagavan's strict instructions that no food should ever go to waste. In the good old days on the hill, all food collected during the day would be distributed amongst those present and consumed there and then, and nothing would be left for the next day, not even uncooked provisions. It was a beggar's life, pure and simple. When the number of devotees increased and Bhagavan's mother came to live with her son, she started a kitchen for the sake of the devotees, whom she wanted to serve. This led to a Ramanashram with a store room and a kitchen and regular cooking. Bhagavan himself was an excellent cook and made a point of teaching us to cook properly. Cooking is the least rewarding work, for good cooks are usually poor eaters and all profits go to others. That is why Bhagavan selected cooking as a training ground for some of his most devoted disciples. It was Bhagavan's order that the leftovers should be used as stock for next day's breakfast. Idlis with sambar being the standard breakfast at the ashram, the leftovers from the previous day would come in handy. Bhagavan would come into the kitchen in the early hours of morning, warm the leftovers, dilute it and add some more ingredients for the morning sambar. The injunction against taking food from the previous day was very much respected amongst the higher caste. He insisted that avoidance of waste overrules everything else and he would never permit God's gifts to be thrown away. As to giving leftovers to beggars, it was not practicable for he insisted that beggars be given the same food as everybody else and not some inferior stuff. Even the dogs had to be fed from the common meal and first too. Every morning, just before breakfast, Bhagavan would enter the kitchen. The vessels containing coffees, idlis and sambar were kept ready, covered and shining bright. He would lift the lid, look inside and say, This is coffee. These are idlis. This is sambar. We all felt that this consecrated the food before it was distributed to the visitors and inmates. Once he came to the kitchen before dawn and put some of the previous day's soup on the fire for heating. Some leaves were washed and cut and he told me to mix them in the soup and continue mixing until they lost their bright green color. For a long time he did not return. The leaves would not change color. The soup was getting dry and I was afraid there might be no sambar for breakfast. Bhagavan came in just before the breakfast. What are you still mixing? He asked me with a bright smile. He was pleased that I had implicitly obeyed him and asked him to continue mixing. The gravy was ready in time and was delicious. Once Bhagavan was frying a large quantity of condiments in a big iron pan over a strong fire. I was standing beside him when he quietly asked me to remove the pan from the fire at once. Probably he saw that more heating would burn the spices. There was nothing nearby to hold the pan with. So I caught the pan with my bare hands, lifted the heavy pan and put it on the ground. I was not at all afraid to touch the hot iron. Nor was I surprised that I would 
that I could lift it without feeling its weight. The surprise came later when I realized how utterly impossible was all that had happened. It was a striking instance of the power of obedience to one's guru. We can all do miracles at the command of the master. We have only to obey. It looks as if what he cannot do himself, he can do through his devotees, provided their faith in him is absolute. One day, Mr. Chadwick was down with a fever. How is he now? asked Bhagavan. I do not know. I have not seen him today, I replied. Please go and see him at once. He left his country and travelled thousands of miles, staying with us and making us his own. Should we not take care of him and look to his needs? said Bhagavan. At once I went to see Chadwick and found him free from fever. Sometimes I was fortunate enough to be able to serve food to Bhagavan with my own hands. I studied carefully how I should serve to please him and was very alert and careful. Yet he would be more alert than me and notice the least mistake. Why did he serve me more than usual? Did I need more food today than yesterday? And why did I get more sweets and dainties from than others? How, how do you dare to make distinctions? People nearby would plead for me. No, Bhagavan, they would say, Sundaram did not serve you more. Look, we got as much as you did. But Bhagavan would not be easily appeased. You do not know. The ego is strong in him. His giving preference to me is the working of his ego. I could not make out where I was at fault, but I took his scoldings as a kind of blessings and would not worry. The ladies would come in the morning to clean the kitchen and make it ready for the day's cooking. When they found Bhagavan there brewing the morning sambar from the previous day's leftover, they would be deeply distressed but would not, of course, dare to admonish Bhagavan. Bhagavan watched them and waited. The distress was real and deep, for they were risking loss of caste. On the other hand, Bhagavan's instructions were clear. No waste of food in the ashram and the same food for all. It was a tug of war between the wisdom of the Guru and the mental habits of his followers. The ladies tried to be in the kitchen very early, but Bhagavan was, but Bhagavan was always there first, cooking the sambar. Once some leftover sambar was taken to a devotee's house and when it was realized that it was a leftover sambar, a special ceremony was ordered to purify the house. On hearing that, Bhagavan told the ladies, Call the purifiers and get your kitchen purified. I shall never more enter your kitchen. The women, for the sake of their orthodox customs, lost Bhagavan's constant presence, company and guidance. It was a real tragedy. Each devotee in the ashram believed that Bhagavan was God incarnate himself. Yet, when God himself went against their religious customs, they would rather cling to their customs than to God. Thus, again and again, we drive God out of our midst. A disciple is expected to choose between life and form, between truth and convention. Blessed were those who had no other rule but obedience to Bhagavan. One day, we were cooking a variety of yam which had to be cooked very well or it would irritate the throat. In the earlier days, Bhagavan would not would know what was going on in the kitchen and there would be no trouble. But now we all had the freedom to cook as we liked and the yam was not properly prepared. I got orders not to serve any to Bhagavan. I would not dare disobey, so Bhagavan did not get his yam. He noticed at once and asked the attendant, Look, I was not served that yam. The attendant called me and I had to explain that the yam might irritate the throat, for it was not properly boiled. Was it right then to serve it to everybody else? was Bhagavan's bitter remark. It was clear that he was trying to teach us the simple lesson that in his presence no rule was valid except the rule of the absolute surrender. 
but it was not an easy lesson to learn again and again old habits and loyalties would assert themselves and make us pit our will against this to our greatest harm once a moon eclipse was due at about 7:30 pm which is the usual meal time in the ashram it was decided by the management that food would be served at 5:30 pm to enable everybody to avoid taking food during the eclipse but bhagavan was neither consulted nor informed perhaps it was taken for granted that meals are not taken during an eclipse the bell rang at 5:30 bhagavan inquired what the bell was for he told that the dinner was to be early for an eclipse was coming oh is it so said bhagavan but he did not join others in the dining hall no food was served at 7:30 bhagwan looked significantly at the clock but there was no bell at 9:30 the bell was sounded and all sat down for food but bhagwan did not appear people were told that bhagwan was not hungry and they had their dinner without him bhagwan would never grant holiness to his body or to anything that touched his body once a devotee asked him for a morsel of food from his leaf as a sign of grace bhagavan refused point blank even if i give you so little others will ask for as much and there will be nothing left for me he joked visitors would not always be treated equally and complaints would reach bhagavan that in the matter of food or accommodation distinctions were made for instance higher castes were enabled to follow the restrictions and limitations imposed on them from birth hospitality demanded that the needs of visitors should be met at there were grumblers bhagwan's standpoint was quite clear he used to say mix rice with vegetables or curds wrap measured quantities in leaves and give each visitor a parcel thus everybody will be served equally and only who came for the spiritual progress will have the courage to say to stay the idea that people came there to have a good time will vanish and other troubles along with it it appeared to be a simple and easy solution but the management was anxious to please the visitors and the idea was not considered in justice to chinnasami one must say that there was very little discrimination and a minister would sit for food by the side of his pune the feeling that in bhagwan's presence all are equal was very strong only the orthodox brahmans who would not interdine at home would not be permitted to do so in the ashram and had to eat in their own enclosure the idea was that if they obeyed caste rules at home the ashram was not the place to break them Bhagavan was not a rebel or a reformer he did not discourage people from following the religious customs at home but in the ashram he would not take all customs for granted in the ashram he was the religion and the custom and those who would forget it had to face his very strong will om namo bhagavate ramanaya